Welcome to the MBA Jam Podcast with your host, Avinash Bajaj. Hi folks, welcome to another episode of the MBA Jam. Today's guest is a very successful business person who is a founder of a company that has a special place in my memory. I'll tell you why. About 10 years ago, while at university, I was working part-time for my father's business and he asked me if I can get some business cards printed. I was young, I wanted to impress him. So instead of going to a local printing shop in my neighborhood, I decided to walk into a store that I'd seen on my way and I was very curious about. The store was not ordinary looking, it had a nice colorful branding and looked very professional, unlike most other local printing outlets. I went in, I was freaking shocked. There was this booklet with literally tons of business card templates that I can pick from. I loved the idea that I had so many options to pick from. This would not have been the case if I had gone into my neighborhood printing store. They would ask me how I wanted. I'm not a designer. I would have given them the most simple and boring design. But at this store, I can have the best looking design I wanted. Anyway, the name of this company I'm talking about is Printo. And the guest we're interviewing today is the founder of Printo, Manish Sharma. Manish, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me here. <laughs> no problem at all. So Manish, how did you how did you find my story and is this something that you see a lot of people associate Printo with? You know, it, it's funny. Uh, it's absolutely what most people associate Printo with. Their first experience uh, when they're starting or creating something new and mostly that's business. So uh, the first step in a business is getting a business card and uh, uh, I meet people almost every day who who've been generous enough to give Printo a chance and they show me their card and say, hey, this one's from Printo. So yes, you're right. Great. Perfect. Great. So Manish, how would you describe Printo to the world? I think it's what we call it. You know, it's exactly that. It's easy one-stop printing. Uh, it's a place where you can walk in and get a ton of your uh uh, business as well as personal needs done which are around printing and uh, we try to make it easy right that's what our promise is so anything from a uh, if you're wearing a business hat anything from a business card to a project report to a poster uh, to standees flyers anything that you need to create and grow a business and the way I'd like to describe it for for personal products is it's a place where you can uh, you know uh, share and celebrate memories so uh, you walk in, if you've got photographs on your phone, you can just uh, uh, convert them into canvas prints, into photo books. Uh, uh, you can order invites. Um, and uh, we try to keep it simple so that you can come in and pick some templates, see paper types, look at samples, and uh, pick a personalized product. Uh, yeah, that's, that's Printo. Perfect. Great. So you mentioned a little bit about the fact that if people want to get some stuff printed like on the phones, but when you got started, I think you got started back in 2006? Yes. yes. So back in those days, probably technology was not as evolved as it is now. So can you talk a little bit about your motivation or your inspiration to start a business like this? I mean, what, what made you figure that this is the good area to be in? You know, a lot of time entrepreneurs come across needs uh, because they themselves uh, face a stumbling block. So I was, uh, I'm from Bombay and I, I'd come back to India. I thought I'd get some business cards printed because uh, I was just meeting a lot of people. I was thinking about, hey, should I take up a job or should I start something new? And uh, I had such a poor experience when I went for my first printing card. Um, and I went to the next shop. I, I didn't get done from the first one. I had the same experience. And then the third shop, same experience. And this kind of... Uh, got me thinking that uh, Bombay is not a city where people refuse business, but uh, why is this happening to me? And I didn't even haggle about the price. Um, and soon it was clear that this was a, a low uh, transaction value. And uh, it did not interest most of the printers. So they didn't want to spend time with me. You know, and in fact, in Bombay, you deal with st uh, print shops uh, from the pavement. They don't even let you in because, you know, Bombay has got very little space. And... Uh, yeah, and that's when I started investigating this business. And I uh, realized there were high margins. It's a high gross margin business. Uh, and if uh, one could figure out a way to get customers to you, serve them well, 
perhaps uh, there's an opportunity uh, to make a profitable business. So, uh, you know, I worked on some research, put together a plan, and uh, decided to give it a stab with uh, one shop in Bangalore. Great. No, and that that's that's fantastic. Um, what kind of investment went into the starting the first shop? You know, we we spent about um, I'm trying to look back, uh, maybe about one hundred and fifty thousand mm-hmm. dollars. You know, and uh, those days uh, the dollar was much lower, so I think it would be closer to quarter million dollars. And uh, um, and I, you know, we uh, we just had a different plan. It's changed a lot since then. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what we decided. We'll invest in the business to set up a a shop and maybe a shop and a half, right? You know, uh, if we could make some money, we'd have some money on the side to set up the second shop. Right, right, right. And you got you got the firm started with your wife. If I'm, am I correct? Yes. Yeah, so my wife's the one who knew anything about printing. <laughs> you know, I, I was I was a complete bozo. I yet. Uh, I'm not the best when it comes to printing, and she uh, she's the one who helped me with my insights into the business. Uh, since she worked with Xerox in um, in both in India as well as in e- uh, in the UK, um, so uh, she could validate some of the assumptions I had made. And uh, yeah, she wasn't a willing conspirator at the beginning, but uh, slowly I nudged her along and said, "Hey, uh, you know, just come along for a few years." and uh, and then uh, you can go back to you know a day job if you like. <laughs> so yes, she was she was my partner. How long did you give yourself before you decided to you know not continue with this if it did not work? <laughs> I I thought I'll give it a year and a half or so. Right, you know, a year and a half, couple of years. You know, I, I you know I thought it might be pretty obvious if it's not working within that much time. Right, you know, uh, and. Uh, this business is such that uh, um, it should be obvious very, very soon that uh, this is not taking off, right? So you've got to keep experimenting, keep changing things. Um, and by the time you change things, you know, maybe you'll make... Uh, uh, so we, we did an MVP and uh, in some sense, you know, and uh, uh, the MVP started working a bit, tweaked it, started working better. And I think within a year, we... We knew this is less than a year, maybe about six months. We knew this is working, uh, but I'd given myself roughly about a year and a half to two years max. Perfect, perfect. And how how is printer doing now? Yeah, it's moving along, chugging along. We you know we are uh, we're not doing we're not doing too bad. We are you know twenty three stores. Uh, we are in uh, four cities, right? so in uh, Bangalore, Hyderabad, Chennai, as well as Pune. Uh, we uh, we should be in our you know in our fifth city in another uh, five to six months if not earlier. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Great, great. So it's it's been ten years now, and you mentioned yeah. um, you come to twenty three stores. Uh, is that a kind of progress that you had imagined, or did you are you did you think you're going faster or slower than what you had imagined? You know what I uh, what I imagine as I tell my friends that you know. Were, when you set out and you put up a, uh, you know, this uh, this rosy picture saying that this is what you want to do. So I'm a, I'm literally at about ten percent of what I imagined we mm-hmm. would be, right? uh, and uh, perhaps maybe twenty percent, but uh, nothing more than that. And I thought in ten years we'd be far far ahead. And uh, there's a lot of naivety involved there. You know, when you're uh, putting a stake in the ground, you're making a bunch of assumptions. Uh, you're not really sure uh, how things are going to pan out. And uh, when I look back, I said that uh, is 23 a number that uh, uh, you should have, uh, you know, aimed for then? Um, I say no, I should have aimed for maybe maybe not 10 times the number, but maybe a large enough number to uh, put in systems and processes which uh, make this scalable. So, uh I think uh, yeah, the answer, the short answer is no, I'm just at 10% of what I want it to be. Mm-hmm. Uh, the longer answer is that uh, that's all right. right? Today I've, I've realized that uh, you want to always think uh, and build a business, design it for the long run, mm-hmm. and as if it's going to be a large business, right? but uh, operate it as if it's a very small business. Yeah, 
yeah I mean what I found the most interesting was the fact that you know in today's environment you actually see a lot of offline stores in fact there are many offline stores that are even going out of business with online taking over but on, on, on one hand you have something like Printo which is actually going pretty strong so how is this offline versus online debate in your company yeah I, you know we decided uh, that uh, offline is going to be here to uh, you know going to be here to stay but online is surely going to be here to stay as well fine and uh, the early years of uh, uh, online uh, maybe in online uh, we had Vista Print who set up shop in India as well uh, about I think seven years ago mm. uh, and a bunch of other guys who you know who entered India and set up uh, online stores uh, our take was clear that uh, we will not be able to compete with them uh, and uh, there is a separate market for those who like the online service mm -hmm. and there's a different market for those who have instant gratification across the counter and who, so let's just focus and build a better offline experience and when the time is right let's start integrating uh, offline and online experience so for example we just launched uh, launched an app which allows you to uh, use your phone to order with uh, you know spot a local store order with the local store go and pick it up in half an hour you know or have it delivered to you in a few hours time uh, so I I think the uh, we were under a lot of pressure uh, yeah, from all stakeholders to do something more aggressively in the online space and I'm glad we didn't because we would have just burnt the money right uh, mm. uh, we would never have been able to compete with companies where the CEO and the entire team is only focused on online customer experience and delivery. Uh, for us, it would be a small division. There's no way a small division uh, without the kind of leadership can uh, uh, focus uh, and build a business and compete with somebody who's uh, uh, completely focused on that. At the same time, we know that the online business would have taken a lot of money and a lot of capital, which we didn't have. So. Uh, um, I think in hindsight, uh, you know, today when I look at uh, all the uh, online businesses um, and I was just, you know, uh, we were looking at acquiring one of them mm -hmm. and uh, I was just doing a research of all the businesses, the largest one included, uh, Printo in terms of revenue size is uh, larger than the largest one and in terms of profitability, uh, none of those businesses are even EBITDA positive, while Printo is bad positive. Now, this is not saying that, hey, Printo is an awesome company, it's just saying that online is a difficult business to get right, and I'm happy uh, we spotted early that we can't play this game, we don't have the skills uh, or the resources, and um, if, you know, if somebody just cut us a large check, we would have been doomed, all of us would try to spend the money on online, and I don't think we are smarter than the current online players, you know, they are pretty smart folks. Interesting, interesting. So it's 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 interesting to hear that that was a very conscious decision, um, yeah. you know, rather than trying to go into either direction very strongly. Because that's that's something probably I've seen where some offline stores want to follow the online just because everyone's talking about it. But as you mentioned, once they enter, they they are left clueless, and then they end up in the middle of nowhere. Right. Right. Yeah. That's true. Great, great. Um, you mentioned about revenues. Are, are you allowed to disclose the revenues? Yeah, it's difficult to do that uh, on a call, but I must say that uh, every uh, every six months, uh, especially in January, you should be able to get my revenues uh, um, off the comp you know Ministry of Company Affairs uh, I website. So I encourage everybody to check out every company's revenues there. We follow the UK system. Uh, you know, so just like uh, in the UK, I don't know if you know about the company house. Yeah. Uh, which, uh, yeah. So you can go to the company house website, uh, uh, pay a one pound fee, and access any numbers. Uh, same in India, you, for hundred rupees, you can legally access profit and loss and balance sheets. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, that's that's great. So you mentioned you're profitable. Yes, we are. Okay. Okay. That's great. That's great. Um, just going back on some of the points. Um, did you always want to be an entrepreneur? No, I'm not really. <laughs> I, I, you know, I don't come from a business family, though my my father did attempt to do business a few times. But primarily, he's a, you know, he's a 
techno commercial guy he's uh, he's an engineer uh, who who runs you know who, who was in uh, a shipping firm in a marketing role and you know eventually landed up being fairly senior there but uh, i i didn't think i would do business in fact i would uh, i would dislike <laughs> the business because uh, my dad used to always work for businessmen and you know i could see that uh, he ha- we had our weekend picnic snipped just because there was a call from the owner right uh-huh. and so for me business was pretty much about this evil thing uh, there's a owner running it who's going to like uh, who flogs his people right so that was the concept when i was <laughs> Uh, and uh, so I didn't. Uh, I I didn't ever think I'll do business uh, at all. It just just so happened that this opportunity, uh, one opportunity came up one day, and I, you know, I decided to uh, join a couple of friends and start a, a software company. Uh, and that's how I I got into business. And then once you get into business, it's bloody difficult to get out of it. <laughs> and, uh, um, uh, unless you go broke. So there was a time when I went broke once. And I was in the U.S. and the dot-com bust had hit, so uh, that forced me into employment, and I had a great time working for somebody. So it was great fun. Interesting, interesting. So how are you as a boss? <laughs> I, I'm a pretty, uh, you know, I'm uh, I'm working on myself as a boss. But I think I'm I'm uh, I, I'm a person who is pretty much uh, I lead hands-on, but I'm learning to, uh, yeah. To today, mentor more than you know, lead actively from the ground. Um, I also, you know, uh, no longer run my organization. Uh, I have a president and CEO who is a senior gentleman. Uh, he runs the organization. Uh, so, uh, in fact, uh, uh, I'm learning a lot from uh, from him on how to learn. Uh, you know, how to uh, how to build a large organization. So he, he's a gentleman with 20 years of experience from Unilever, uh, and uh, he uh, he's built many large businesses. So uh, that's how uh, that's what I'm. So it's my it's my uh, training school as well nowadays. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, as as a boss, I think I I used to abdicate more than delegate. Right. So, okay, yeah, and I think uh, now I'm uh, yeah, uh, I'm learning the finer art of. Uh, uh, of being a boss yeah. so yeah as long as it's fun I don't mind being the boss <laughs> interesting interesting so you mentioned the CEO so that's Mr. Balu Ayer yes yes he's my president and CEO interesting interesting okay good uh, now coming switching gears a little bit and talking about your MBA <laughs> um, so you finished right. your MBA at Oxford yes I did which year was that 2004 so I, I was there 2003-2004 Okay, and how do you think your MBA has helped you since then, or has it? <laughs> you know, uh, it's helped me immensely, uh, but from a very different perspective, right? Uh, I think uh, if I'm a relationships person. It helped me build relationships and discover new friends in you know uh, a, in so many different countries, right? And uh, and I've uh, I've been lucky enough to forge some very deep friendships, so it's just completely improved my quality of life. Right? And uh, a, you know, uh, I talk to some of them on a, um, a on a weekly basis, uh, uh, sometimes on a monthly basis. We we definitely meet up uh, once a year, uh, meet up for events, uh, you know, meet up with family and kids. So. Uh, we, so it's not helped my business uh, directly. Uh, this part of the uh, yeah, this part of uh, the aspect, uh, this aspect of the MBA, but it's helped make me a better person, and maybe that's why uh, it's helped my business in some way. Um, secondly, it uh, of course the skills I picked up. You know, I was all I joined an MBA because you know uh, I was interested in economics and finance, and uh, yeah, I think uh, that over a period of time became my strong suit. So uh, yeah, those are skills I um, I value, and I and I think uh, yeah, that's uh, that's about the only thing that you might pick up in an MBA in terms of skills. Those are the only you know teachable skills. Right? It's like uh, it's like math. You can go step one, step two, step three, and soon start from addition, subtract, subtraction, 
multiplication and teach somebody differentiation right over a one year period um, yeah, so so these are yeah, these are two direct impacts on my business of course uh, an mba also brings you uh, some sort of uh, you know uh, vain credibility you know with the if you go out and raise some money right and uh, uh, with some investors i uh, i don't think it's a it's a big one but in our case uh at least in my case it was uh, you know a, i could see that credibility popping up every time you mentioned that uh, you know you did an mba from oxford they suddenly thought oh this guy must know what he's doing right so you can fool a lot of people uh, uh with a nice mba degree interesting interesting did you know what you were doing <laughs> back <laughs> then <laughs> during the mba no i mean you mentioned the fact that it does help um, you know establish credibility and 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 the reason i ask is because that's um, a similar way in a similar thought that people get when i approach with some ideas but to be yeah. honest yeah. i myself sometimes don't know what i'm doing uh, yeah. so it yeah. it's it's yeah. to our benefit that it helps but yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, i i agree with you i, I don't think uh, um uh, it helps at all but you know but I, when i look back though where it may have helped and where there might be some value to this is you know we used to have huge debates about various business propositions and various things in my in my mba class and this was not just mm-hmm. debates online uh during the class but uh, offline uh, in a pub and uh, it just it just starts making you uh, look at different perspectives of the problem right so uh so i i wouldn't say that uh, you could ever put a finger on that which class is it that you learned that in mm. right but uh, uh i was just lucky to have a wonderful bunch of classmates right uh, and uh, you know we we eventually i think can safely say that uh, we learned as much from each other uh, if not more uh, than from uh, yeah, than from the regular classes because you know, i had students uh, taking classes on um, you know on weekends uh, teaching about stuff which you won't find in mba right you know on uh, how to negotiate a vc agreement right was one i remember anil chang uh, lawyer uh, uh, lawyer friend of mine uh, from the us took took this class you know somebody else talking about uh, sales uh, uh, another friend from Stuart Easton talking about uh, networking um, and how he practices it, right? And uh, I think these were some invaluable lessons that I picked up. Great. No, that's that's very interesting points you mentioned about the pub because, um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of lot of great discussions um, come out of just interacting with the right kind of people, and and the discussions right. don't necessarily happen. to come by a one way teaching but the kind of people you yeah. surround yourself with yeah so the reason i was asking about the topic of benefiting from an mba because as we have you know heard a lot controversially you know what is the direct roi or what's the intent what's the tangible benefits that you get from an mba and actually i just yeah. wanted to focus a little bit um in terms of running a business in this particular scenario versus um working in a company because i think you've done a bit, little bit of both um do you see any skill sets that particularly apply to either scenario as well from what you love, from what you go through in an mba um you know not really right so i i discount the mba significantly right and uh, a, uh so since you mentioned that as a point i'll you know i'll take the liberty to answering this in uh, uh in more words than you intended sure. uh, me to um so i see an mba as uh, uh you know as a very very new uh the uh, a new science if i may I, you know if at all or, or even if you call it as part of liberal arts eh, as compared to science or technology in general or art for that matter right which is 5 6 800 years old and guess what for they've been teaching uh, both science math uh, art and literature for you know more than 7 800 years um, management is new management is something which was so you had traditional management which was yet a little more scientific uh but then you had the modern management brought in by the us right with the uh, mba schools uh like harvard and the like uh starting this off and um, yeah, and us schools have done a fantastic job 
in general in in uh, in changing the education the higher education landscape i'm not so sure that though that the mba degree yeah, is something which is uh, uh, which is something you can teach right and you can the mba curriculum is something you can teach especially if you don't have enough experience so uh, um, and even if you do so i went to an mba when i was uh, 30 right and uh, i was pretty clear i needed 6 years uh, of experience at least before uh, before i went in for a good mba and uh, and i think that helped me appreciate a few things much much better than uh, uh, some of uh, my younger colleagues um, my wife did her mba at nottingham uh, when she was much younger i think when she was 23 and uh, she didn't have as good an experience because uh, of not because of her college or teaching but it was more of her experience itself in work, at work so i don't so the you know the longer answer is that maybe it's time for everyone to revisit mba itself okay? and uh, and the reasons mba works so the mba works in some of the top schools because of networks bunch of other things uh, it's a good time to take a year off after you've been working for about 6 7 years you know and do that i uh, yeah i'm not a big fan of uh, you know recommending mba for any other reason you're not going to come back uh, wiser you may if you just spend that time because you were just exploring yourself exploring a few other things and hence uh, wiser but uh, no other way so applying it to business of course finance helped me right it was you know much easier for me to develop business plans and models but uh, did it uh, we, was it the make or break in my business no the finance was a good to have function business modeling and planning was a good to have function especially if you're starting a business it's a good to have it's not it's not necessary right it's uh, means you don't need advanced uh, capital market uh, modeling skills right you don't need to know black scholes for uh, for a simple business plan you just need to know you just need to have common sensical finance so i don't think that's a, uh, a that's a huge plus a, i think what mba gives you is uh, um, which i saw for a lot of people who hadn't got pub- who hadn't had public speaking experience it gave you gave them a lot of confidence at the end of the course it helped people put together nice ppts and express their thoughts succinctly it helped people model certain situations much more easily uh and i think they are useful skills but i don't think they are uh super critical skills right i think so i think they can be taught they can be learned uh teach those skills to my managers or my preference is them to uh managers um in a meeting room right because uh, and i think some of them uh are far more skilled in their sales and marketing and uh and planning techniques than um i ever was thanks to my mba interesting very very interesting yeah absolutely i i i completely tend to agree with you on on pretty much everything over there um because there are some yeah. things when i was doing i wish you know that um i had some of the learnings as you mentioned before i started and in fact yeah um there there are there are many things because i i still keep thinking are there any things that can be done differently um what do you mm-hmm. think could could be very different so let's say for example you got the opportunity to become the program director of of an mba you know course what are some of the things yeah. that you think you would want to do change i i would most probably disband the course right <laughs> if i had to tell you honest to myself right it's a it's a, a it's a nice cozy club all of us mbas right and especially mbas from top universities uh you know it's a cozy club mm-hmm. a yeah the european cozy club the british cozy club and the uh, uh the uh, the us cozy club so i i would do some deep introspection if i was the director um if i had to have to do this i would introduce a lot more uh a, practical appreciation and skill development on bunch of things it don't just have to be you know uh you know, a set of courses which are you know or or behavior development uh, or marketing i would actually go out and you know look at the arts look at the science look at various kinds of courses and uh, 
But what do I think of? I think I would just create a sandbox where people can come in, interact, uh, learn a few skills uh, which are which can be taught. But overall, they just walk away with uh, more about the interaction and what they build with their hands. You know, when I say with their hands, it's figurative. But uh, 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 I would do an MBA more like a sandbox concept, right? Saying that, hey, let's build a small business, right? Let's solve this specific problem. That's all that it would be all about, right? Um, I would chuck the case study completely out, right? I think the case study format uh, is... Uh, it's a shame that we yet use it, right? It's, it's the silliest thing to do. It's like saying that, hey, this is why Cisco, uh, how Cisco solved the problem in this big market. Uh, it's one thing to know about it. It's an interesting read, but it's a second thing, you know, but to try to take data in the past and, uh, a, and call yourself a crystal ball you know, gazer is, um, yeah, is a silly activity, right? So I don't think case study should be used as anything to build uh, your business acumen and skills about because every time you start going and solving a business problem, you'll start thinking, okay, what, uh, what is the case study that I should refer to, which is not what business is all about at all, right? You would, you would draw upon experiences of others, yeah, but definitely not haloed case studies anywhere. So I would restrict case studies. To, we had a lot of case studies as well. I know American universities have a lot more of them. I'm so glad I didn't go to one of them. Uh, yes, and I'll, inter I'll just encourage uh, student interaction uh, a lot. So as a director coming back, I would be very scared that, my, that this industry is going to be, uh, you know, uh, is going through an upheaval. And I might encourage the upheaval and in which I might find an opportunity, if you know what I mean, right? If, uh, if this industry is going to be dismantled, uh, I should be the person dismantling it so I can make money um, with from whatever the new opportunity is. I think I think I think the sandbox concept is is probably one of the best concepts <laughs> I've heard of you know mm -hmm. since I've been discussing about this. Um, but just mm -hmm. to relate to the experience you had um, when I did my MBA, uh, Imperial from London is supposed to be one of the more entrepreneurial environments, supposedly. But right. I think the one thing or the most important thing I found lacking was real industry experts or real practitioners right. coming in spreading their knowledge or awareness because yeah. it was it was almost we were asked to build businesses because you could say they tried doing the sandbox environment by you know, allowing us to build a business, but that was also in a complete vacuum, and businesses don't exist right. in a vacuum. You know, unless yeah. unless yeah. you actually have competition, unless you're actually um, you know talking to developers and figuring out things, it's mm -hmm. it, the the learning which is supposed to create a differentiation doesn't actually create a differentiation because once you go out in the real world, you start realizing that that was a complete sham. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. You know, and uh, I think the one one thing I enjoyed in Oxford, though, we had uh, almost all our professors, you know, uh, yeah, invariably were were fairly fairly honest and down to earth when it came to uh, appreciating this aspect. So um, we had in economics, we had the you know the governor of the uh, yeah, the ex governor. Uh, of the Central Bank of uh, of Mexico come mm. in and speak to us, right? And uh, he didn't speak about how well he'd done. He spoke about all the problems he, he had faced and how the mistakes he made. Um, and our best speakers were those who came in from outside and spoke about their mistakes because that's that's where the learning is, right? And uh, you don't get anything right the first time or you, you get very few things right the first time. So you're true, industry practitioners make a big impact and we were lucky to have a few of them come in. I remember uh, our operations management class was something which I really enjoyed, the, uh, the supply chain management. We had in industry practitioners coming and talk about how they tried different things. Now, even the choice of the practitioner is important, right? Uh, is, he, is he just going to talk about his uh, business as this awesome, you know, uh, working unit or is he going to talk about how he got there, right, by making the mistakes 
and what sort of mistakes he made, which uh, mm-hmm. which then gets you thinking, right? Uh, and yeah, let's let's you have debate. So um, yeah, so yeah, yeah, uh, you're right. I think business is uh, is much more than just uh, um, just much more than just a formula. Yeah, are these are these some of the key points you did know before you went into Oxford, and you you still. Um, you know, took a conscious decision by speaking to some of the earlier students or how much of the learnings did you know or expect and how much of the learnings came out after you actually went through the course? Yeah, I was an MBA by accident, really. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was living in London and I was fond of economics. So I said, hey, listen, I should go and uh, see if I want to do a master's in economics for a year and uh, let's go to Cambridge. And, uh, Cambridge said it's too late, but you know what? The guys who teach us economics, to which economics, uh, very fine folks, who also, one of them also takes a class in the MBA program. Uh, so why didn't you apply for an MBA program? I said, okay, uh, I did that. And then a friend said, uh, you know, Oxford seems to have a nice program as well, right? Uh, why don't you go and check them out? Uh, it's okay. I applied at Oxford as well. So I applied at both places, not doing too much of uh, you know, research on should I do an MBA? Um, I think, yeah, I just had a, uh, yeah, I just had this whole thing about let's take a break and let's spend a year uh, having, you know, just making friends, having some good beer, so, and learning a bit about economics, right? So uh, that was my expectation. So from that expectation, I was completely thrilled, right? I had a, mm. I had a fantastic uh uh, you know, uh, while I didn't choose Cambridge, I had got admits in both. I chose Oxford, but uh, I think uh, the Oxford professor, I was, uh, you know, a fa- fantastic guy, Oren Sussman, who taught us economics. And um, I was very happy with, uh, uh, with the way things were. But I think I was, I could sense that a lot of my colleagues didn't necessarily have the same expectations. The expectations were the typical MBA expectations, right? How am I going to get a awesome job once I get out of this place and and, uh, and I'm going to really rock once I'm out of this place and um, I thought I, I thought that is a that's the false promise of an MBA yeah yeah I, I, I agree I think the expectation management is something um, that is really important um, you know when you when you get started mm-hmm. off and also while you're going through it because if you don't have the right expectations or the right knowledge right. before it it can get really um depressing and disturbing <laughs> yeah 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 you're right uh, so so you know considering some of the listeners of the show um if they had to go around you know doing some kind of research before they decide to do the MBA or decide a university, what what sort of advice would you give to them? What kind of research do you think it might be worth for them to do? Uh, uh, research, do some psychological research and say, why the hell do you need the crutch of an MBA? Right. Right. Once, you get the, once you get that out of the way, right, you, might be, you might make a much better choice uh, of whether you want to do the MBA uh, the, at all, right? and uh, mm-hmm. and I'm saying this seriously because uh, yeah, I I think uh, the MBA courses, uh, the MBA programs worldwide are under pressure, right? and uh, and they are you know they're clearly very expensive, and there are different ways to go about achieving those skills. I would uh, I would in fact uh, ask people to focus a little more if their interest is in in finance or economics uh, mm-hmm. into an MFE course, a master's in economics. And uh, or even a master's in management, uh, which is much more serious management th- uh, in our theory. Uh, having said that, I would uh, have you know a couple of things that if uh, if people yet insist on doing an MBA, I say okay, at least do it when you're old. Uh, uh, do it uh, when you have enough money. Yeah, um, you know, I didn't, uh, mm. I didn't. Uh, taken loans for my MBA, so I had a different experience because my expectations were different, right? I could relax then, you know. So, uh, so normally, if you do it at about thirty, you'll appreciate the MBA much more. You would have less pressure uh, of uh, yeah, you wouldn't have taken a full loan. You would have taken a partial loan, if at all, right? So the pressures would be less, 
and um, uh, yeah, these are the two important things. Besides that, I think uh, it really, really uh, matters in which, what do you see yourself do post the MBA, whether you want to choose mm-hmm. which region. So if you want to be in finance, you want to do in, uh, you know, uh, in marketing, our management, any region is good. Uh, if you want to do uh, software, uh, perhaps something in, uh, uh, you know, in, uh, uh, in the U.S. or closer to the software, uh, software belts. If you want to get into, you know, for example, product management, and you could comment on this as well. You've done a fine job with yourself in, in London. Um, I would have uh, reckoned that if I wanted to do product management post this, I would have chosen MIT uh, or Stanford or, you know, uh, Irvine or Berkeley for uh, for an MBA. Okay? Uh, but uh, at 30, I didn't want to spend two years doing uh, an MBA and that's the reason I chose, you know, even after this, I said, hey, listen, I don't want to try any other places. So my, 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 uh, my advice to them would be simple, do it late uh, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, uh, so that they can appreciate it and uh, yeah, pick the region uh, that, you, yeah, that you like based on what you want to do, you know, uh, post that. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree uh, with those points. In fact, to add a couple of my own. Um, so yeah. in my case um, as well, I think uh, in terms of expectations, the, the good thing or the fortunate thing was that I went with the expectations that this is going to be a learning year. It's not, uh-huh. it's not necessarily something that, you know, I just because I've done MBA, I'm not, it doesn't make me privileged to get a job. You know, right. I still have right. to work hard enough to get a job and yeah, the kind yeah. of job I want. And mm-hmm. as as usual, when someone does an MBA, the first thing they try to do is probably get into consulting, uh, <laughs> because mm-hmm. that's, yeah. that's supposedly um, you know something that pays well. Uh, I right. tried, I failed, and and the, looking back, the reason I failed miserably at it because I never had my heart in it. It was not. It was never mm-hmm. something that I ever got interested um, preparing as you mentioned as you touched upon case studies uh, you know most right. traditional consulting firms still employ the case studies method of interviewing and mm-hmm. it just seemed very different from what I wanted to do I was interested in businesses I was interested in new products I was interested in innovation I was interested in technology um, right. somehow they never seemed to focus on any of those aspects and um, you know, it, during MBA as well, the exposure you get to new technology and new products um, was very limited. As you correctly mentioned, if that was something I knew would be limited, probably, you know, focusing on the kind of universities that have that kind of exposure would be a lot better. Um, mm-hmm. That's the reason after I finished my MBA, I did not even take up a job. I decided to do an internship. Again, that mm-hmm. seems very ironical because most MBA students who pass out feel no, no, the, the internship is too low for us. <laughs> um, right. But that's right. something right. that uh, at the end of the day, what's important is the fact that you need to know where you get the most learning from. If that right. learning means you go do a job for free, you just do it for free. Uh, you know, Absolutely. You have spent a lot of money on doing the MBA, but that's a personal decision that you have to live it. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'm glad time. you did that. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think uh, uh, we, I think any job, right? Even if it was working in a store or mm. something, you know, uh, one should do it because just. Uh, uh, and in, if someone says you've done an MBA and you're doing this job, you say, hey, because I've done an MBA, perhaps I'm going to take away more from from this job than uh, anybody else, right? Uh, they might just look at this as an internship. Or for me, I'm soaking in knowledge all the time. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And and that's something that's probably stayed on the longest uh, with me. So so in my case, probably the one thing that I learned the most out of MBA was the the art of, you know, being curious, the art of asking questions, the art of wanting to learn more about different situations and environments. And as you correctly mentioned, you know, f- 
surrounding at the end of the day there's a very popular phrase saying you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with and the right. the people right. who are coming into some of the MBA courses are are pretty bright and you know they're pretty brilliant they, they've been successful in some or the other area uh, of their right. life so probably the kind of caliber of of people you're being with is is high and probably that's the one important factor that really helps uh, a lot on the other hand i think forming goals in the beginning can get really handy um, because then you can consciously huh. work towards the goals in fact if if i had to pick you know one of the most you know areas of the mba which probably annoyed me the most and something that I would want to get rid of first is a career services team. <laughs> I don't know how it was with you at Oxford, but um, my experience with the career services team hasn't been the greatest purely because of the reason that, again, there's very little industry relevance or experience they bring in. In fact, what I would suggest and propose for MBA schools is to actually form career services team out of alumni. Yeah. Alumni have right. such deep experience that maybe even pay them to talk to current students a couple of hours a week. <laughs> um, right. Right. So right. What, what do you think? How was the career services in, in, in during yeah. your time at Oxford? So when is I that was something? There, yeah. uh, when I was there, it sucked. <laughs> and uh, but you know to the school's credit right we told them it sucked and uh, you know uh, we had a three member team which did a consulting assignment on uh, yeah, what you know the school should do and i was part of the uh, three member team in fact i was leading that assignment Great. and uh, and we presented it to you know the program director and the dean and uh, they took it extremely well right and and we'd made clear recommendations fire so and so right and uh, well they didn't do it right away but uh, they did it in a year and uh, he and replaced them with a you know very dynamic person who uh, when i hear when i speak to folks passing out now who's yeah they, they tell me she's done a fantastic job uh, on the career services side but i think this is also cultural uh, europeans mm -hmm. um, and especially the brits you know, don't like asking for two things. They don't like asking for, hey, can you, uh, you know, press their, they don't like to press alumni for jobs or money, right? While, uh, uh, while American schools are very, very clear on that, that you studied here, you're going to give back. You're going to give back by trying to hire people from the school. You're going to give back by sending in donations to the school. And, uh, you know, and they make, they make no bones about it, right? There's no no shame in uh, doing that, and uh, and I think it it works. Um, at the same time, I must also say that uh, you know career services uh, for larger schools like Wharton and Harvard and Columbia uh, is is a strong sales activity. So it's a sales driven activity. There's incentive for everyone placed, a significant incentive, and it also helps that these schools have have been our old schools. Uh, they've been there for their MBA programs are, uh, you know, 50, 60 years old, if not longer. And uh, so they have many and they have batches which are massive, right? Watson's got at least at 10 years ago, they had an 800 size batch. Yeah. Right? So they have 800 to 1000 people getting out there for the last 60 years, right? So uh, they will have a much better network. So if that is a key focus, right, that I need to get a job right away, uh, I would strongly recommend uh, uh, American schools, you know, over uh, over uh, European schools, except for a few exceptions. But in general, I would do that. Perfect, perfect, great, great. Um, right, Manish, I've taken a lot of your time. Just a couple of more questions. Uh, are you okay? Yeah. Uh, yep. <laughs> okay. Great. Um, so one thing was, you know, if you had to give top three career tips for those considering to study an MBA besides everything you mentioned uh, do, you, do you want to summarize like the top three uh, get to know your friends get to know what they did get to know what sort of problems they solved and where they got stuck in their business problems right uh, that's it that's all that matters right learning from your colleagues would be my 
top one, two, and uh, you know perhaps the third tip. I didn't even buy a single book during my MBA course. The only book I bought was after I completed my MBA. Uh, I realized there was one book uh, yeah, which was you know Besenko Economics of Strategy, uh, which I bought. So uh, don't waste time in class except for speaking to your friends and colleagues. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks for that. And are there any key tips for people who want to apply specifically to Oxford for MBA? I think uh, Oxford uh, appreciates people from diverse backgrounds. So if you, uh, you know, if you've been working, so so uh, highlight that. If you've got diversity in terms of, I don't mean diversity in terms of sex or race or color, but diversity in terms of experience, right? Uh, if you're working with a public sector bank in India, right, uh, you want to go for an MBA, Oxford's the place, right, because uh, they'd appreciate this. Um, they, would, uh, yeah, they wouldn't look at the standard template. So uh, <clears throat> I think if you've, got that in your, uh, if you've got that in your past, bring that out, right, and highlight that. Rather than saying I achieved $2 million of sales for my last company, uh, that's important, uh, but not as important as saying that, you know, I spent uh, six months, you know, working on this project in, uh, you know, in, in the nonprofit sector. Right. So uh, I think they they used to appreciate that. I believe they yet do it, right? Uh, from the kind of people I meet uh, coming out. So um, that's the only tip I'd uh, give them. That uh, and of course apply apply a little later in your life, right? Uh, it's it's appreciated because then you'll be able to bring out many such experiences. Perfect. Thank you. Um, final question. If the listeners want to know more about you and want to get in touch with you, what do you yeah, suggest? Uh, I'll, I'll just give you my email. It's uh, Manish, uh, M-A-N-I-S-H dot S, S for sugar, uh, at printo, P-R-I-N-T-O dot I-N in. So it's Manish dot S at printo dot in. Mail me just to write the, you know, put, uh, uh, you know, Maybe your your program's name, the MBA podcast. Is it the MBA Jam? Yeah, the MBA um, Jam. Yeah, the, the, the MBA Jam and the subject. So I'll know where it's coming from and uh, it won't go to spam. Perfect. Thanks a lot, Manis. Thanks a lot for taking okay. out your Thanks. time. Um, good luck for everything. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks and uh, good luck. Yeah, you seem to be doing a fantastic show. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to The MBA Jam. Now it's time for you to take action. Head over to the MBAJam.com to listen to more episodes and discover great resources.